two, one. So today we're going to review Bird Box. Uh, so what do you think of Bird Box? It was interesting. Interesting, kept, yeah. Kept my attention the whole time. <laughs> you know, sometimes it with these free movies like on Netflix, it's very easy to just, yeah, yeah I'm done with this. I guess they're not really making their money out of commercials, um, subscriptions. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, like, how do they know? I guess I guess they would know a movie is successful. There's a lot of view or rate to it, but like, they're spending like twenty million dollars in making this. Like, we're they're not selling tickets for this, right? Right. So, like, how are they making their return on that? The, the budgets that they have for these movies are huge. You, yeah. You <laughs> wanted they had they had Sandra Bullock, John Malkovich, right, or more or less a list. Um, celebrities actors right. so they probably were expensive yeah i would say um it's good to have malkovich in there i'm not a big sandra bullock fan uh you know she does her miss congeniality she always plays like these kind of ditzy characters that uh i have no fan of i think she was also in um this futuristic movie where she's like a cop in the future um i think it's got a uh, sylvester stallone in it maybe um Re- yeah. not repo man Maybe yeah. Rico Man. Um, but yeah, it's uh, something that I would say I appreciate it. I think she was good in the movie. I would say later I'm going to bring up, though. Demolition Man. Demolition Man, right. Yeah. Um, that was a fun movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was very cute back in the day. You right. Know? She was like uh, that, that, whole, that whole shtick that she had where she's like, yeah, ditzy, but also, you know, Cute and saves the day. You know she had she had a lot of good, right? Like I mean, she looks great for what eighty four years old or something, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I guess she's what fifty four. Fifty four. Yep. Yeah. Um, really enough, somebody brought up that uh, which reminded me that she did do this one on an Ellen DeGeneres show where she's uh, going out there saying yes, um, this cream, this facial cream to keep me young, rejuvenated. It comes from uh, mutilated parts of a baby, right? Its origin comes from uh, extraction of uh, stem cells from foreskin, right? Wow. Yeah. And so she's like excited, ecstatic about this, telling Ellen DeGeneres, like, yes, you know, you too will want a penis facial cream. And Ellen DeGeneres is kind of, oh, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can imagine Ellen DeGeneres wouldn't be too interested in that. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And she looks great too for <laughs> what being 60-something. I don't know. Right. Um, so there is that part, which I can't really excuse. That's the kind of weird part, which I think this whole thing is going to tie into, um, parenting later, but I want to go into some of the nitty gritty of this sort of stuff. Like a lot of the sources were like this. What do you think about them not showing, uh, the monster or the thing? Right. So that I, I read somewhere, I just did a, uh, one night, you know, crash course in this, in the internet on this movie and they, one of the things that she mentioned was that there was video, there were there were clips of the monster, the creature, and it was like this weird green baby faced something or other like uh, creature. And they decided, I guess, against it could be that whatever I read was bogus, but it, it it seems to be that it was too difficult to make people take the the evil creature seriously. Enough. Right. So better to just let your mind wander and just imagine what it could have been and sure you know that that seems to make sense um i don't know i'm curious what what uh what did you think of i think it's supposed to tie into a lot of people say it's like very uh lovecraftian demon monster like uh, cthulhu in which like you these things that you see are so uh ineffable indescribable uh that your mind has no way to process it and you go into a fit rage of madness um, so I think they're called like Ildrix and ghost like beings. Um, and I could kind of see maybe that kind of being the case. Uh, you have, uh, you know, you have some weird moments where like there was John Malkovich's wife coming out there and saying, uh, mother. Right. Uh, and then says, don't go. All right. So like for her, it seems like a moment of sadness. Um, yeah. some other people seem maybe it was a moment of fearfulness some people describe it as beautiful i was like the psycho guy right uh greg uh so i guess it's uh could be a cthulhu thing it arises originates from romania it starts off with, with the newscast before it spreads to russia and, and europe uh i think it's interesting that this thing 
creates voices in your head telling you to take off the blindfold, right? So some people say, well, it's not a malevolent thing. Well, the malevolent thing is telling you to take off your blindfold to look at it, right? So maybe it is. Sometimes people think maybe it's uh, like an outer space, other dimension being or animal just kind of mind its own business. But then you see the uh, near the end when she's not listening to this thing, uh, the thing kind of just charges at her, tearing through the forest. Uh, so it has some sense of... Um, physical properties, um, has some sense of uh, consciousness, I would think. Um, so yeah, I think maybe uh, has some ornaments in Romania, could be some vampire lore, could be a Cthulhu thing. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned the forest, and that seemed to be where it was strongest, too. Yeah. It was most, it was talking to the kids, it was talking to her, and it was telling, it was using people's voices that she re- recognized. And she wasn't even, you know, using her sight. She was just using, so it was using her audio, you know. She right. Could, and and this, that was interesting. And then, but also the, there's a there's another thing this reminds me of, which is the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Where, oh yeah. Where you know you're not allowed to look at um, Yahweh, and if you do, you explode. You, right. You know, burn to death alive or something like that. And so there's this, it's this always this concept of like these things are too big for you to be able to perceive them. And if you do, you know, you, you don't, you're not prepared to handle it. Yeah, I don't know about that. Like, what, what do you think of that? Do you think there's something that could be too much for you to understand or for you to uh, tell apart what it is? Right? People say like, uh, there's this myth, I think, like they say, well, Native Americans, when the ships came here to the shore, they couldn't see them. There's some stupid little movie that came out there about um, what the bleep, do you know, or something like that. And it ties, try to ties really weird metaphysics and um, false signs. Hmm. And so there's a scene where they're saying, yeah, you know, there's a, a moment where Native Americans couldn't tell there were ships there because they never had anything to identify it with or connect it with. But, you know, you would see a big uh, object out there in the ocean coming out there. You're not blind to that. Um, maybe you didn't have a word to describe that. Uh, there is a... Like the Japanese, for example, didn't have a word for blue until a couple of decades ago. They just never, um, not that I don't think they, they could see it. They just never had, um, or maybe they just never had an opportunity to produce those kinds of dyes. Because um, you find like, there's a guy who's kind of going back in history, trying to find like recorded mentions of like the color blue. Couldn't really find any, hmm. anything. Um, the only place that really had anything was like in Egypt, but like in Greece, there's hardly any mentions of the word blue. Uh, and for most of history, there's like some rare mentions of other colors, but it starts to really pick up until like a century or two ago. Um, right. The things maybe that they're not seeing, it, it's, well, it's so prevalent. It's the sky. So they, it's right in front of them. Maybe they don't, uh, it is the norm, whereas everything is judged against it, you know, right. against blue. I mean, where do you see like blue flowers? Right. Or, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It it is. That's an interesting uh, point. Yeah, the the norm versus what you know, what the what my breadth of experience is comparing what I see to that. Sometimes they'll say that. uh, Well, you know, we don't want to reveal that there's aliens here because people aren't ready for that. They'll go crazy. Uh, We can't reveal what happened to JFK. Maybe Uh, you can't reveal uh, a lot of information. People even say like baby steps towards libertarianism. You know, you can't reveal too much about what libertarianism is. It might be too much for people. You don't want to have baby steps, right? Right. So it's just like <laughs> you're coddling them uh, to understand uh, the non-aggression principle or free markets or capitalism. Uh, so it's weird that people kind of have that kind of approach to these things or even towards libertarianism. Um, I would say the interesting part of the source where this comes from, because they're talking about this in the news uh, in the very beginning, while she's painting, saying like, why haven't you turned on the news? Like, Let's see what's going on here. People are reporting that there's mass suicide in Europe, right? right. And that reminds me of the current <laughs> mass suicide uh, in Europe in sure. terms of uh, the mass migration coming in there, and they're going to uh, outproduce Europeans in terms of birth rates. Birth rates in Europe uh, are like 1.2, 1.3. France is pretty low. Italy is pretty low. And whereas the government uh, mandated uh, importation of people who are anti-Western have like birth rates of like 3.0 and, and above, right? So when you kind of look at the numbers, 
exponentially, they're going to outnumber you. And since it's a democracy, mob rules, right? Minority mob right. rules, they be, will be able to change uh, Western tradition, right? To shoot their needs towards like uh, Sharia law, for example. Right. At the beginning, she talks about, she says, uh, well, that's happening over there. That's not happening here. And so it's very, you know, this is the way people comfort themselves to say, well, um, whatever's happening <clears throat> over there won't, won't come here. So right. well, I'm just going to go back to painting, you know, right. go back to my fun, fun life. And uh, even with the, the problems facing her, she, you know, pregnancy, she doesn't know where the father is, or it was a one night stand, I guess she alludes uh, later on. And even with the problems facing her, life isn't particularly difficult, though. Right. She's still able to. And then there's this massive paradigm shift, in, in, and it happens almost instantly. Right. Right. I would say, uh, I, yeah, lack of preparation, I think, is a problem. A lot of people are too um, coddled, cozy up. Um, have that kind of mentality. It can't happen here. Uh, I think <laughs> you can find Europe is our bird box, I would say. Uh, the canaries are right. screaming and dying in Europe, and that should be a wake-up call uh, to the problems that can occur here. The problems that are starting to occur here are similar to the ones in Europe. And other countries in Europe should also be paying attention. Poland is paying attention. Um, if Poland falls, you know, and it'll make it very easy for all the other countries to fall. So it's very good that they're very based in not falling for this uh, mass wave of anti-Western people migration. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that if there's another an analogy to that would be <laughs> the fall of Western civilization. Because uh, you have a problem now in Japan, not with migration, but like economic uh, problems in which you have, it's too costly to get engaged, too costly to have a relationship. So... Why bother being involved in one? And so as a result, you have low birth rates. And, you know, that's the a high cost of uh, economic uh, living now in Japan. Right. They'll, they'll travel all the way to Hawaii to get married so that right. they don't yeah. have to go through all the, yeah, the, the present gift, the gift giving and the, the cultural mores involved right. with that. And uh, it, it does, you know, it, it's very, it's very different today. I mean, you know, um, my grandparents got married at a, at a Howard Johnson in New York and, you know, they, they didn't have much of a reception and that was that, you know, and it was very cheap. And today, you know, there, there's a lot of expectations and, and materialism involved with a lot of that. So it can be, uh, it can be difficult to be able to commit. And so you see her in this situation and, um, she has none of that. Right? None of that. Yeah. She has, she has no commitments, but she also points out early in the, in the movie, Sandra Bullock does, that uh, she has trouble connecting. I think you pointed out. Yeah, and we just talked about that in her paintings. Like, oh, you know, what is that? It's like, oh, just uh, you know, it's an inability to connect. You know, and so she's having this kid. So she's already making a lot of excuses why uh, it's a problem. Or even the doctor says, "Look, you got a, you got something in your stomach. You know, it's a melon. It's not a little bean anymore, and it's going to come out soon. And maybe it's a, you know, suggestion for adoption." And I think that's a good message then, right? Adoption. Yeah. Uh, you have her uh, bad relationship with her parents. Uh, you have things that I would say she would not make a good parent <laughs> leading up to this, right? So, yeah, I would say adoption is a good option. I'm glad that's kind of brought up. But I would say that you find later when she wants to try to survive, she names, you know, she does this weird stuff in terms of like naming her kid. Her kids, uh, boy and girl, right. not giving them real names, not actually giving them like uh, motherly affection, but she doesn't really have much know-how to do that, I would say. Right? Her, she doesn't have much of connection with her parents. Right? Her sister is the one who corresponds for her on her behalf. And so I can't really fault her for that, but I could say for the most part, that's kind of what most people go through, uh, wearing blindfolds and parenting, uh, not knowing what it is that they're actually doing, not actually studying and preparing for this. Not uh, looking through the latest journals, uh, not looking through what people have to say about good parenting or the effects of bad parenting. And so I think the biggest thing with a lot of this stuff, aside from like the European thing and being a bird box, is yeah. uh, people being blindfolded, maybe purposefully, to parenting. And I think introducing some of this information to them, sometimes uh, they don't want to see that. Right. They don't want to see or acknowledge like uh, spanking, for example, leading to loss of uh, IQ points. Right. I think like 
loss of sight is horrific already, especially like to to gouge out even your own child's eye, right? They're, they'll be unable to survive in a, an environment like any animal that you mm. <clears throat> stifle their ses- senses, uh, sight or hearing, now leads them to predation. And doing this to a child where they can't see, but then uh, doing it in such a way in which you're beating them to lose their IQ points and their faculties and gray, right. and, uh, gray matter area to to reason and make uh, these logical conclusions to survive, I think is um, it's a horrible thing to do to a kid. Yeah, the there is a huge strand of parenting in this movie, even though it's supposed to be a, a horror movie about, you know, the these crazy creatures. Right. But there's um she is very rough with these kids and she yells at them at some, right. certain points and almost to the it's almost sounds abusive, you know, and uh, she's she's like, you make me so mad or something like that, you know, and uh, it's it, it is odd. It's kind of a doesn't quite fit. But if you yeah understand it in a certain context, I think it does make more sense that she's she's not connecting with people. There's not a lot of expectation for her to have to form relationships and uh but there was one um there's one interpretation of this that I went down a complete wormhole on What's that? <laughs> it's called the um basically I took it um along a Freudian context so there's this Freudian concept called the thanatos instinct and it's called the death drive and it's so in in Freud he's got the life drive and the death drive the life drive you know he's consumed with talking about sex but the death drive is the the opposite it, it, your it's your impulse to take away life and in a sense it's it involves this idea of returning to the womb returning to what is safe hmm. returning getting away from what is difficult in life and returning um, to what you know and what you're comfortable with. And of course you can't make any progress in life by doing that, but it's a safety blanket for a lot of people. And so there's a bunch of different themes where she's, she's where the kids are being treated in a way that shows that they're not fully developed. You know, they're not being allowed to progress in life. Um, but one of the a couple of the different moments that I thought were interesting is, you know, they have to take a river back to the compound or to, to find the compound. This is symbolic of like the water breaking in reverse, hmm. and um, sh- they have to go back into the compound. Around the compound is um, the creatures. It's heavily involved with creatures, unlike any other place in the movie. Yeah, and um, the once they enter the the compound, it's totally safe. It's idyllic. Yeah, there's no problems. Uh, she meets her OBGYN there. Right. Yeah, she does. Weird. All right. Yeah. Why? Why does? Why do they choose to have the OBGYN there? Well, right. I heard that she actually has a real British accent, and they told her to fake uh, an Indian one. <laughs> oh, wow. You don't think that would be even necessary? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's in the United States. Oh, and so in the in the compound slash womb, the boy and girl are given names, and she gives. She just decides uh uh what am i gonna call you uh olympia and you're gonna be tom right and i'm gonna name you after your parental figures right and not give you really your, an idea your own name your own. yeah or, or let you choose what you're you'd like your at name. this point you know they're like already he was five years old right so, right yeah so there's this whole parenting theme and also just this i don't want to have to deal with the difficulties of the world we're going to bring you in. And she even at one point mentions um, to them in the woods, she says, if I quoted it correctly, um, she'll say, don't take my children. She gives, delivers this little soliloquy. She says, don't take my children. I have so much I want you to see, but we have to do it together. And uh, she wants them to see what she wants them to see. And mm. it's going to be in this compound away from uh, everything else. And, um, I think there's a case you can make for this movie being the opposite of what it intended. You know, the idea that what they really should have done was wanted to be able to see, but they weren't capable because they were all limited. <laughs> it doesn't seem like there was much trouble seeing at some points. Uh, like you have, uh, what's the name of the black guy? Yeah. Uh, Tom, I think. Yeah, yeah. Tom. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see, glance a little bit and close their eyes a little bit. Uh, maybe you can wear a shroud. Like, what about people who have already a not perfect vision? Does it affect them, right? If things are kind of blurry, but, you know, you can kind of blur your eyes, 
right? Can you do that a little bit? All right. Uh, I'm yeah. doing it right now. Uh, and yeah, she can see through her blindfold. You can see kind of through your blindfold a little bit. Um, I like the analogy of uh, going down the river as if it's like uh, going to be reborn. And for some of these people, it looks like it was. Uh, you mentioned earlier, like in the books, that the people that they approach and meet, they're gouged out their own eyes. Maybe that would have been. In the compound. In the compound, right. right. Maybe that would have been too much. Uh, <laughs> gifted, blinded students. Xavier gifted blinded students. I think it'd be like a world where only like Daredevil can, you know, excel excel in. Um, <laughs> although you have some people who have like the um, echolocation kind of way of moving around. Right. Um, they use the car. Right. The yeah. They even, the even use the car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of wander around like bats. Kind of like that movie, A Quiet Place, where you have alien bats running around rampant. Um, and some people draw parallels to that. Right. Uh, I mean, I like both of them. Um, and we can do a review of that one yeah. <laughs> separately. There's a father and a mother in that one. Too, there is right? a father. Yeah, yeah. There's a sacrifice in there of the father. Uh, in this one, there's a sacrifice of uh, Tom. But you would think like they know that there's these uh, psychos roaming about that they will set up a trap for them eventually. Um, you know, maybe set up a trap where a house will explode, you know, coming in. Because it's not like they're replete of resources. Because Tom manages to find hair product for his hair and to keep fit <laughs> with all that, uh, where that protein, protein yeah. powder that he must be <laughs> well, I guess consuming. At this point, there's nobody around. You can go to all the uh, supermarkets and kind of raid it for forever. Um, I think they should have followed John Malkovich's advice and staying in the supermarket. <laughs> And you know, I think he did nothing wrong. <laughs> I like I like how you put that because he's routinely proven to be more or less correct. Correct the whole entire time. In fact, yeah. if he had just stayed at the grocery store, more people would have lived than right. would have died. I mean, he's in survival mode at that point, right? It's like, look, we don't have that much food. We need a ration, and here comes someone who clearly will need a little bit more rations. Uh, and then, of course, he lets in the psycho later on. And, you know, I think um, maybe it's too fast for what's going on and trying to set up ground rules. You know, there's not a lot of um, pepper mentality, as you're mentioning earlier, right. uh, for them, like, worst case scenario, what do we do? Right. I mean, that wasn't even his house. That was his neighbor's house that he was suing. But still, he's got a shotgun. He has a gun in a standing. Don't let's don't get too close to strangers out there. This is not a regular scenario. We can just kind of invite everybody and in, right. open the borders, uh, so to speak. And they do. They open the borders, right, without a vetting system of sorts and causes everyone there to uh, nearly get killed. Right. The, the the ability, and this is another point that seems to occur throughout the movie or at the beginning, is different people's reactions to the paradigm shift and their choices, you know, that occur as a result. I mean, the, uh, the one of the big ones is at the beginning when Sandra Bullock enters the home and the everybody's in there and the old lady says um oh um i'm sure the authorities will be coming here any any moment uh, they'll send someone soon and that that's that okay i'm just going to huddle in place and uh you know not think i don't want to think this through too much <laughs> because otherwise um i don't know what to do i have no i have no other i have nothing to bring to this emergency All right like um the problem shooting they went to court, and the, the Supreme, the judge there said, "Yeah, we have no obligation to protect you, right? Right. You're in this time and time again by now, and this is supposed to be like I think contemporary setting, so it'd be Donald Trump saying he's closing the borders, uh, and I would say that uh, I guess their lack of realizing, like even Michigan said, you have no right to education, right? You have all these kind of judgments coming out there, but you know the news doesn't really pick up much on these sort of things, right?" Time and time and again, government saying you don't have a right to any of this sort of stuff. But yeah, um, they're putting their safety in the hands of a government that was only there afterwards just to outline your body in chalk. All right. All right. Yeah. You know, these things happen. Here's our report. Uh, good day. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then you have uh, John Malkovich. I guess they, he says something along the lines of uh, he's drinking in the supermarket. All right. He's slamming uh, a bottle of liquor and he says, uh, we're making the end of the world, quote, great again. And I, I thought that was an interesting allusion to, of course, make America great again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is Netflix. They've done uh, interesting leftist uh, propaganda stuff out there. I think there's like a, a show they put like something about white people, complaining about white people, or I um, can't remember 
the exact title of that. Let me pull it up real quick. Right. But, you know, they, they have their own weird kind of... Uh, I thought the... But him drinking and um, was a kind of an allusion to the issue of any emergency paradigm shift where it's your addictions follow you into that. And so it's best to be able to relieve yourself of them, um, like coffee or cigarettes or whatever. It's a right. good lesson to learn, uh, it, you know, assuming something ever were to happen. Dear white people, that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. But uh, sometimes I'm like, it's Netflix. Here's another weird leftist socialist uh, propaganda film coming out there. Uh, so I unsubscribe, you know, but it's my mom's account. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, oh yeah. Everybody, everybody has, uh, a Netflix account though. So it's always easy to, especially a movie like this, it's easy to talk about. Right. Know? I mean, you have, uh, you could say there's some weird leftist liberal stuff in here where they show, uh, the white males being, uh, weak, uh, very beta. You have like John Malkovich being a drunkard, can't protect, uh, himself or, uh, the people in the house, for example. Uh, he has that shotgun moment, but, you know, uh, he dies in the end. Uh, he gets knocked out by an old lady, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if that's actually something that can really happen, you know, hitting someone over the head. I think, like, for sometimes they show this all the time in movies, yeah. like like a karate chop and thinking that's enough to knock him out. I think you need a lot of force to knock someone out, I mm. believe. It's kind of like um, sometimes you'll show, like, people do, like, this injection thing, um, which can be actually a lethal dose or not enough. And that's, that's why you have oh. anesthesiologists to uh, actually measure like the, what the weight of the person is and then get the acquired dose to kind of knock them out. Uh, there's like a science to it. Hmm. So in movies, like they just kind of go into it, like, aha, that should be it. Uh, done. Yeah, done. Yeah. Solved. Yeah. Right. Virtually, yeah. virtually every white male, except for uh, Rick or whoever the guy was at the compound, is uh, a bad guy in this. Right. Virtually every psycho. But he's blind. Right. Yeah. And so every crazy person who doesn't have to wear the mask is, and that's a whole other, you know, those guys want you to pull off the mask. They right. Don't, they don't need the mask. Yeah. I guess these would be the, the Trump supporters for them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. There's, it's, it's, uh, and then the little gang at the end, they're right. all, all, all white guys or something. Right. And um, yeah, it's, it's a weird sort of uh, problem of every movie where only the bad people, the bad guy invariably has to be the, the white guy. To be white. We, yeah. we wouldn't want to make anybody else the, um, the bad guy. <laughs> right. There was a uh, the I think the rap. There was uh, the white guy who was like dealing drugs. I think he has a name online, Machine Gun Kelly. I don't know what that's about. I guess he's a rapper. But he he does escape with the cop girl, right? In the car. Yes. Right. Good move. Yeah. <laughs> like look, like you guys are having too much problems here. You know, our rate of survival <laughs> is going to continue to get lower and lower the more people you keep bringing in here. Right. Uh, we're going Lucy back to and Felix. Yes. Yeah. I, I want to see that Netflix um, special. They go back to the supermarket and live happily ever after. Right. Yeah. Have a huge family and and they train the kids very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They did, they had the right idea. I mean, you're facing complete uh annihilation life is very difficult and they just decide to start hooking up in the right in the closet there you go i mean she's not too much of a i mean she did just come out of i like how he was just about to pop pills like i'm a police officer <laughs> <laughs> he's like you just got out of academy stop playing <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a paradigm shift you don't realize things have changed right but that was another uh you know i, I created a little list of the problems of trusting the people in your community you know, Lucy and Felix steal the car. John Malkovich wants to stay in the store rather than bring food back to the others. Um, Olympia lets in a random stranger who then kills almost everybody. Um, and they're just letting more and more people into the house. You would want to have, ideally, you know, in a prepper scenario, you'd want to have, like, some kind of understanding about the rules here and what, right. were, what you can expect and what you can't do. <laughs> but this is California. <laughs> I think the book actually occurs in like Michigan. In Michigan, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was looking at the the news thing where like, and it kind of looks kind of like California, anyways. Like they had like hey, jumping to uh, Alaska and then coming down here to the California area. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I think uh, because of that, these people don't really have much of an idea of prepping. They think you know government's going to be around there for forever, right? Right. Um, and trying to get in there into a house, I think it's kind of reminiscent of like. Their problem with their housing crisis that's going on in California, and in terms of 
just letting in just anybody in, I think that is a problem, border issue problem. Uh, you have the situation, for example, where people who are trying to come in here, uh, 80% who are women are raped uh, in Mexico, right, across the border by Mexicans, right? So there's that, that saying where Trump was saying, like, you know, they're bringing in rapists, and that's just uh, an attention drawing to, yeah, people who are trying to get in there will get raped more than likely, right? Sure. Four out of five times uh, will get raped. And not having a vetting system, I think, is a big uh, problem just letting anybody in. You know, you can have like maybe another house where like, hey, if you want to be part of this bigger compound, you need to show that you're trustworthy and live over there for a couple months or something like that, right? Yeah. At least something to yeah simulate the the efforts you would go when letting someone live in your, your own home. You yeah. Know? Uh, it's going to, it's not just going to be, uh, do you have enough money to live here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, they don't even have that, right? If you have a renter or something, whatever. So um, I think... There's there's definitely some aspect of it that needs to be um, difficult. Not just anyone can do. Not right. just anyone can come and join you in your efforts. And whether that be on a small scale or a large scale, sometimes the scale is too large, and that's why you know the idea of uh, that this large of a United States is is difficult. Uh, to, right. To it's good to have those kinds of standards. It's like uh, Anne Rand was saying that you know. Um, love should be conditional, not unconditional. If it's unconditional, you love nobody, right? You have no measurement in terms like what it is that you love. Uh, and she was saying that, you know, you should love someone for their virtues. Um, and if you're just saying just love anyone just because, then love is meaningless and it has no real weight. Um, and for kind of the same when people say like everything is violence. Well, if everything's violence, so you can't define like what is not violence, then, you know, the word is kind of meaningless, right? And the same factor, like people say everything's racist. If everything's racist, if you can't define what's not racist or what is racism, uh, the word itself has lost its meaning and value. Interestingly, uh, along those lines, there was an article written recently um, about this movie, and it is called uh, Netflix. Netflix's Bird Box is about white people not wanting to see racism. I saw that one by uh, Vox or something like that, right? Or right. no, The Root. The Root yeah, by yeah, Michael yeah. Harriet. <clears throat> and uh, That's he, quite a stretch. Yeah. So <laughs> it, 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 uh, was, it came out immediately. He obviously didn't waste any time after None, watching yeah. this movie writing this article. I mean, I thought it was kind of clever, though, some of the stuff that he, he says. Um, she's certainly, he says, he points out she's certainly privileged. You know, she's like a painter, and she's pregnant, and she's like, oh, life is good, <laughs> like most well, she's, people. She's 54, right? <laughs> yeah, so he's amassed some wealth. His sister is uh, raises stallions, you know, so. Right. Life yeah. is good. Life is good. I mean, so I thought that was a good criticism of their lives are not real, um, but. Relatable, yeah. <laughs> But uh, anyway, yeah, it's so it, everything you could, I'm sure, use this movie to see any number of crazy. I think that's themes. what this writer, I think I was reading a little bit of that. And he says he kind of just kind of used all movies to kind of, or lens of racism, um, even outlandish you know, points that he can try to make. He calls uh, Tom an Uncle Tom. Oh, really? No way. Or <laughs> it implies that he's an Uncle Tom for supporting all of these white people. He's the guy who sacrifices himself. Yeah. Well, for the, I the mean, 19 kids. minutes and 30 seconds in, he already starts uh, hitting her up, hitting on her. It's like, hey, is, is everything right? Maybe you want to sit down for a second? It's like, here we go. <laughs> but, you know, it's the end of the world, and Machine Gun Kelly has already got his eyes set on the cop. You know, there's, you know, who's left? Stake out. Yeah, yeah. stake out your Sandra Bullock. <laughs> he's thinking, um, you know, long term. <laughs> yeah, that's so. You could say that's a good, uh, you know, long term time preference there. I mean, and yeah, so there's there there's a lot in here. Now, one thing he doesn't do, um, this this writer who talks about the racism, is uh, he doesn't point out that all of the people that want you to take off the blindfold are all white people, which is a major hole in his theory because presumably, um, you know, it wouldn't be. They wouldn't be the first ones to get you to take off the blindfold and see the racism for what. But I don't know. I thought that was limited. Like <laughs> liberals trying to tell you that you're racist and telling you to take off the blindfold and check your privilege. Right. Right. When they themselves are, right. ins are insane. So they would say like only the insane people could uh, could see these things and be fine. I guess maybe these people uh, have or are living with their demons, embrace those demons. Uh, kind of messed up already in the head to begin with. I remember reading, I think, in something about the book where like even animals 
or affected by this. Um, right. So I think that's kind of weird. But yeah, people like Gary, I like his drawings. They're pretty fun drawings. Right. Yeah. That's that's a random little moment that they right? jump, they yeah. interject. He plays the music while they're giving birth upstairs, and he's kind of just, you know, living in there and living livingless, and just kind of drawing these Cthulhu like figures. Right. Yeah. You uh, you walk in on that, and it's like time to go, buddy. All right. It's your they're at the door. <laughs> All right. So there's this uh, Edgar Allan Poe story called uh, "The System of Doctor Tar and Professor Feather." Right. Tar and Feather. And it's uh, it's a fun story where it takes place. Uh, he wrote this in 1845, Edgar Allan Poe. And these people go into an um, this this one guy goes into a asylum to hear about this new uh, technique and healing uh, these alien people who are of need, uh, uh, people who are mentally challenged or they're insane. Yeah. Um, but he goes there and he finds the technique is abandoned and he finds the staff they're wearing a little bit too, being too much and their mannerisms and the way they dress and their interactions. And then later he comes to find that the staff member and the person in charge, the administrator, uh, are actually the insane people. And some time ago, they managed to trick the staff members and imprisoned them and took over the insane uh, asylum. And uh, I've, I think in some some of the variations of stories, he escapes or he, he himself was an insane person going in there. Um, but it kind of reminds me of uh, Gary because he comes in there tricking them, yeah. saying that uh, there's insane people out there, the psychos that escape from an asylum and they're after him. Uh, but he himself is an insane person and he probably – took those clothes from someone else and came from that uh, asylum himself. Right. Yeah. He says, uh, as he's like killing John Malkovich, I'm sorry that I couldn't help you see. Right. Yeah. That you didn't get to see. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, he, he's a bizarre, I mean, I would really be interested in hearing somebody's, somebody's rundown of that character. That's a, definitely a good tie in though. Yeah. Because uh and who who better to go to than Edgar Allan Poe and trying to dissect a you know sort of horror gothic type of uh type of movie because yeah. a lot of his themes are probably trotted out over and over, you know. There's um this so the Gazi out scene kind of reminds me of something that happened that I found in the on the news a while ago. So it's a young woman, I think she's like twenty years old, Kaylee Mathart in Anderson, South Carolina. This past February, went in front of a church and just gouged out her eyes. And just hmm. took it out. They found her holding her eyeballs in her hands, and I was I was trying to like, whoa, that's that's fucking crazy. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. And I, I tr- I, there was a follow up later, a couple months later, like because I'm trying to figure like, what well, what's going on there? It's like some kind of weird Cthulhu moment or something yeah. like that, right? And in, in front of a church, apparently she was on drugs. Uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> That's Met what them, happens. Yeah, methamphetamines or something like that. We were trying to figure out whether she was patient zero. <laughs> That's what's right. Yeah. <laughs> bird box. <laughs> it turns out. I ah, know, just dope. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that's the real lesson is that opiates are the real. Huh. There creatures. is an opiate crisis in Virginia, right? Yeah. So yeah. A lot of people overdosing, dying from that. <laughs> yeah. The. Um, and there was another. There was another just to- toss away point that I thought was funny. Is that a lot of this emanates from Russia? And they make a point of mentioning Russia, and uh, the president closes off the borders, and um, the the problem moves from Russia to Europe to the West Coast on that little map. Uh, you know, crosses over into Alaska, and um, it seemed like that. You know, if you wanted to, you could say, "Oh, you know, that's Russia controlling our government and." Controlling our president and yeah, and uh, you you know you controlling us ultimately. You know, whereas like they're not USSR anymore. Or, you know, we're all the Russian bases in the world versus U.S. bases in the world, right? Right. It's it's, it's us kind of pretty much controlling uh, us. The U.S. government controlling pretty much everything else in the world. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's really controlling the U.S. government. People can say maybe Israel in terms of like the billion dollars in aid, um, but yeah, that's kind of weird. I mean. Uh, they're saying this because he has business ventures in Russia. I mean, he's a businessman. Uh, he actually, this, I'm not saying like um, pro Trump or anything like that, but before the presidency, he actually created real uh, employment, right? Not false employment through, through the federal government, right? right? Uh, what do they call him right now? Because it's uh, 
uh, the government's kind of frozen right now, but you know these are like government non-essential. Shutdown. Yeah, oh, but yeah, yeah no. they, these are non-essential employees. <laughs> uh, all, all government employees are pretty much uh, non-essential. Right. Yeah. Correct. Uh, but you know, <laughs> the government shut down. How does that affect our lives in terms of this? Like in terms of bird box and like oh, you know, everything's gone. Right? There's no no one going. No one's coming to save you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if that also happened here in terms of like no funding for the police, right? No funding for uh, for federal service. You know, people would just like, all right, you know, we really don't need federal service to kind of go out there and enjoy the parks or to stock, you know, the toiletries in the bathroom. And mm-hmm. there's some reports right now where that is happening, where people are actually uh, maintaining parks themselves voluntarily. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's not like uh, only government can do it. And like you evoke this magic spell word government and you know everything's taken care of so right. i think uh it should continue <laughs> this government shutdown uh hopefully that can continue even longer uh but yeah you know you see that uh today right now no no one's running a mass panic no one's uh shooting each other in the face <laughs> there's no purge going on right now right the um yeah that that idea of people wanting you know this protection or security they're gonna. They can get it from somewhere else too. You know. I, I know that uh, I was talking with a few people the other night about uh, Sham Rim, the neighborhood watch group in New York, and they're sort of the li- liaison between the police and the uh, Orthodox Jewish community in New York, and um, they have a certain ability to speak with the police, but that you know they can also handle matters and report matters on, on their own. And you could imagine a scenario in which people hire. Mm-hmm. Uh, security or police for their local community that reports to that community that yeah. they've hired. So they have an incentive to uh, use less less violent means, you know, and almost no violence if, if they don't really need to. All right. And uh, so, you know, you could picture, okay, if, if the police disappeared tomorrow, a lot of those guys would then have to find work actually selling their services right, right. themselves. All right. The only place I think like a problem like this could occur is like what's happening in Brazil and which like before the the presidency of the election there was a problem which like government was kind of suspended with police services, but they also made it uh, with their gun control laws uh, difficult for anyone to have a gun. And so you did have a spike and increase in crime, right? So of course government will what 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 the mean will say that, you know, government will Break your legs, handicap you, and try to sell you a wheelchair. Right? right, that doesn't even work. Harry Brown. Yeah, so that would be, you know, people will say, well, you know, that see, that's what happens. We don't have a government, but that's that's a result because you have government. That's a result because uh, they didn't allow yourself an opportune time to go to the market and purchase means of defense. Uh, and whereas here, it's I think it would be virtually impossible because you have uh, the right to, you know, arm bears and. That's not really been aside from bump stocks, but yeah, you you can you can have guns. I think that's great. There's a lot of people that kind of laugh at us, like um, like England, London, um, but you know they kind of needed guns to defeat Germany at some point, right? Sure, yeah. And could you imagine what would have happened if uh, Germany had been able to you know come into the UK and you know regular people then might have had to create a war of attrition so that they wouldn't, you know, they would have to take neighborhood by neighborhood and right. it wouldn't be worth it after a while. Right. But the, uh, and then, the, yeah, it's, it's always interesting how that becomes, uh, you know, the, Oh, you're crazy. You know, that's never going to happen. And you have so many instances of, of regular folks, uh, being able to step in when, you know, power devolves and, and yeah, you know, there, and there's no, there's no people coming. There's no police force coming to save you. All right. And that's pretty much California because I think government can do everything for them. I think for the rest of the part of the country, they'll be all right. Maybe exception for some New England states like um, New York. But for the most part, I think everywhere everywhere else will be all right. Um, There is, uh, of course, a parallel to the allegory of the cave with Bird Box. Uh, You can say like being blindfolded, things you kind of seen in terms of uh, Plato's allegory. These people have been kind of chained up and you can say imprisoned in a cave. Right. And all they've seen is uh, the reflection of shadows of uh, fires behind them dancing. And they grew up creating like this kind of story of what these sort of things could mean. But they don't know that right behind them is this fire. That is this um, somebody's controlling that until their chains are free and they can step out of the cave and they can see things for what they are. Um, but the thing aside from that would also be like, how do you know that the cave that you escape? So not something of a larger cave system that you need to look at too. Uh, 
yeah, I guess there's a lot of cool stuff out there to kind of explore, but right. these people kind of, at some point, I think it's kind of like that uh, uh, elephant that has that chain to just a, a chair and can leave anytime they want, but they've just been conditioned to stay to it and thinking that it holds so much weight and that weight is like in their heads. Uh, and I think a lot of people do that to themselves. Um, I think it's hard for a lot of people to kind of go to a point of taking the blindfold and just start to reason and apply logic t- or um, look into all the stuff that they've been taught and maybe could be wrong. And not to say like you're bad yourself, you're a bad person for believing that or you're um, wrong but misled in some case. Like again, this goes back to parenting where like they throw kids into uh, daycare centers or strangers to kind of teach them. Uh, you have um, – Listening to the guy that just passed away recently, who did a lot of uh, work in exposing the public school system. Um, mm. Let me think. Think about that. Well, so you know, the last thing you want to do when you have kids is this: you know, surrender your kids to uh, a group of people that are just going to brainwash them otherwise into saying that the only authority that they need is government and not your own parents, right? Right. Daycare centers kind of do that. Government is pretty much a giant daycare center. Uh, for that effect. Yeah. Um, so I think like even going back to like spanking your kid, people are like, well, I don't want to confront that because, you know, my parents did that to me and I don't want to, I'm not saying like judge a parent harshly for that, but have a conversation. So that in the event that you have kids and you have your parents watching over them for them while you're out of town, like yeah. they don't do that. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I had, I had this, um, my girlfriend's friend came over recently and I guess they said that they had a conversation about considering whether or not they should circumcise their kid. And I wasn't there during that consideration, but so it's like, so did you guys do it? And it's like, yeah, we ended up doing it. And I was like, thank you to myself. Well, I'm not going to shame them or anything like that. Uh, yeah. I'm still trying to be friends with my girlfriend's friends. Uh, <laughs> You're a terrorist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to understand. Uh, I brought up some interesting points, but like, I didn't do like a harsh like analysis of like the effects and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, maybe later I'll, I'll show him so that. If they have other kids, more kids, they won't do it. But um, I think that's also a weird effect that some people do where they kind of, um, they'll go to like their mother, like, you know, you're such a bastard for doing this to me. It's like, most people don't really know. Right. You know? Yeah. That's the thing about uh, like peaceful parenting is that, that, I mean, immigrants from Ireland, you know, a hundred years ago didn't know that you you could do better by your kid. If you weren't, you know, hitting them with a switch, yeah. you know, from a blackthorn tree or something, they just didn't, they didn't, there was no education, you know, they were right. so ignorant. And, uh, so the, the, that was, they, that was the, the solution that tradition had created and it worked, but only up until then. And we, we now know that there's a lot of information to say, Hey, you know, do you want your kid to have a higher IQ? You know, do you want real tangible results? Then maybe it's a good idea to avoid that. completely. Yeah. And, uh, so it's the same as, you know, developing any other other thing. If you look at computers and the way they've developed and the information that we've, the processing power has gotten only better. So why not want to uh, approach that the same way with parenting? When your program doesn't work, you don't throw tea on it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like this other Netflix show, I watched uh, Choose Your Own Adventure. Have you seen that one yet? Mm. Okay, so it's like... It's very interactive. So, like, there's this one scene where this guy is like, you can select. It's weird, or you can it diverges to different areas of the movie, oh, and you wow. can choose where it, you want it to go. So, this guy's having a problem programming his computer. And you can choose destroy computer or throw tea on computer. I was like, I don't want to do either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the you know, and there's a certain amount of, and a lot of people won't admit it, but there's a certain amount of you child are making me angry. You're holding me up. You're embarrassing me in this public place, and uh, so I'm going to make you pay because right. I am offended. I'm angry, and so there's definitely uh, an amount of that that happens. And uh, people, you know, people would admit it. I'm sure in the darkness of their own right. mind. <laughs> For them, I, that's like the uh, parenting handbook that was given to them, or lack thereof. And in First Senator Bullock, there was a lack thereof. And so maybe, you know, this movie could have gone a different direction. It's like, I'm going to give this kid up for adoption for someone who actually wants to parent a kid. Mm -hmm. And that would have been an interesting story, right? Um, Not an engaging story, but at least uh, (laughs) 
a place where it should go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The story, I guess, helps, you know, because it's not real, it, it enables you to see, okay, what's the result of her decisions and her choices and uh, the path that she chooses to go down is not ideal, you know? Right. But, uh, there, yeah, it's it's an interesting movie. There's a lot of themes. I'd be really interested to see what somebody like Jordan Peterson or whoever had to say about the different uh, topics in there because... He'd bring up the lobster because the, there's this one black guy that was talking about, you know, there's these ancient myths and uh, cults in which they're talking about uh, mothers who have uh, a child in the womb would see their children be birthed into becoming lobsters right. or spiders. So maybe top lobster. Uh. <laughs> it was a weird little interjection. Yeah. But if you think about the way that she was approaching motherhood. Yeah. It kind Same of thing. Fit. Yeah. It was, uh, th- this is a foreign object to you almost. You're kind of closed in on yourself. You don't right. have a lot of love to give. To treat some like baggage, unwanted baggage. This is kind of stuck with. Right. Yeah. There's that, yeah, that commitment is kind of missing. Like, do what I say. Um, I'm going to very, she's very harsh with them. And uh, it was, you know, she says, well, it's for their own good. Um, but, you know, it, th- that doesn't seem, Tom seems like a more sympathetic figure when she's arguing with him. Yeah. He's, get, he's get telling them stories. Yeah. And she's, she eventually relents at the end and says, yeah, you know, Tom was right to tell right. you those stories. Uh, so I guess the last thing we can go into is just uh, when you see them, like, kind of like the Matrix thing. It's like, you know, I don't want to see the Matrix anymore. I want to plug myself back in. <laughs> I want to know that the roads will be provided by government. Right. Uh, I want to know that taxation is uh, the price we pay for civilization. I want to forget about everything else and its actual real consequences and how all this stuff is extracted. And you can say that. Maybe that sometimes there is a difficulty in people to remove that blindfold because uh, they're they are stuck in it. They they have uh, a history in it, maybe a family history. So like, people even on the conservative side, yeah. difficult for them to see like maybe the military is a socialist arm of the state, It's a war welfare state, so to speak. And so for them, it's difficult for them to see. It's the same arguments that you have against the welfare state should be the same one against this one. And it's again, we've shown even to the bunny ranch that. We will defend property rights, right? People, there will be voluntary militias. I mean, the first war against England was with voluntary militias going out there, right? right. With Minutemen. So it's not to say we want to be able to defend ourselves. We're the most well armed population in the world. Uh, and it's not to say to like disperse the military, but it's to show that us Americans can defend ourselves, will defend ourselves uh, with or without a military and can create these uh, militias ourselves. Uh, I think. Uh, that's a blindfold for conservatives. Um, and right. so I guess you can say with, with cops as well. Um, right. But, you know, eventually you don't want to be blindsided at the very end thinking like you've been waiting for the government to come protect you and then it doesn't come. Right. right. There's so many instances of that where people exhibit these blind blindnesses to things. And rather than become angered by it over time, I, I've just developed an ability to maybe just understand because I knew that I had blind blindness to things before and um so i should be charitable with other people who might all be in a state that i was right so but you know you point out i think it's it's interesting because with the soviet union um they took away people's ability to to access a lot of resources freely in a market-based system and so right after the collapse of the soviet union a lot of people a lot of the older folks said, I wish we had it about like it was, you know, because that's what they were used to and a return to the womb of sorts. And so the idea that, um, that, you know, some people were more comfortable with the system as it was, it's also difficult to rip away and tear off the Band-Aid and then say, have a good free market now. You know, it's hard to suddenly create one. It's kind of like those people who get out of prison and they've been in prison for 20 years for like cannabis or something like that. It's like, you know, I don't know how to exist outside of here. And like, you know, I'm going to do a crime so I can be sent back. Right. I got friends there now, you know, it's everything's on a schedule. I got three meals a day. Uh, It's simple. Instead of going out there in terms of uh, having to rip off the blindfold and trying to interact with other people, you can say, right. I sign a bullock. Uh, Maybe it's another analogy or metaphor in terms of like, um, Social media, people are not actually going out there and interacting with one another. Everything's about texting-based. Everything's uh, avoiding uh, personal contact with one another. Um, so, 
Uh, I think uh, ripping off the blindfold could be uh, it's like a double edged kind of meaning. Are you the one ripping off the blindfold? Or are you the psycho? Right. Or are you um, on the other end uh, afraid of like the truth of, of the things outside there that you kind of put yourself in? Right. The danger is is not so much the blindfold or the creature coming at you, but the fact that you had to put on the blindfold at some point and then the your and so your ability to deal with whatever you would see was paused at a certain point right. and so if you were you know if you had oh, never had the blindfold in the first place it's like uh trying to lift 315 pounds on the squat rack af- after never having trained uh, for squats you know it, it's impossible uh it seems incredibly daunting but yeah. after having trained for 5 years or whatever you do it no problem that's uh, that's the blindfold, right? Right. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the blindfolds is uh, their fears they haven't conquered, right? Their insecurities they haven't gone over, uh, errors in their life they haven't um, uh, faced or uh, challenged or defined for themselves. A lot of people have defined what are what, what's virtuous, what's moral, what are ethics. Uh, and I guess for them, like in a very like harsh moment for like whatever this thing is, like, bam, this is what it is. Yeah. And just kind of upends the world because they haven't had a process moment to like to process it or uh, take it in for themselves. It's like, fuck, you know, maybe I'm a horrible human being because I paid taxes once. I voted for Obama. Oh, fuck, kill myself, right? Uh, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that's uh, another parallel towards uh, facing, like, you know, the only way you can get out of your comfort zone is to to move yourself outside of your, your safe space and uh, to contest that and challenge that. And maybe that's kind of what these blindfolds should kind of represent because it's different for everyone. For some of these people, it's a moment of sadness. Like maybe a mother, like this one lady was saying like, Hey mom, is that you? It's like, please don't go. Right. And some people might be a horrific thing. So, uh, fears that they kind of induce themselves or trap themselves in, uh, things they haven't been able to get over completely. Um, so maybe it's not just the cycles. Maybe it's just people who are fine with that. Cause in the book, Gary, the guy who comes in, uh, is this really trying to reveal them that, you know, these they're just creatures, peaceful creatures out there mm-hmm. and trying to show them the beauty of it. And he's per- kind of portrayed differently in the book in terms of the movies from the stuff I've read about, right? Mm. And so it's not supposed to be like these creatures are not supposed to be like these malevolent beings who are just kind of running about doing their own thing. Um, so maybe that's the intention of the original author. I, I mean, well, having watched a couple of your, your clips in DC where you're interviewing people and seeing the reaction you get to what seems like not a very crazy thing to say. Yeah. And you're like, no, no, <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> and it's because those, that same thing has been developed, that same protective mechanism that I don't need to worry about that because the government's handling that. Right. Or um, that I'm protected and you benefit from the roads. And right. So, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of, things put into place and uh once you start challenging that people get very defensive and you're maybe it depends on like how fast they remove their blindfold right blinded by like the, the fire of knowledge and so like all right you know here's some light you know figure it out right right um like there's this one guy in front of dc uh liberal who is in a rock band who was talking for like maybe 40 minutes and it's like huh all right cool yeah all right you know i wasn't like yeah, you know, in your face, <laughs> get triggered. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, or like uh, that one guy whose wife was in the background, and I was asking him the question, like, you know, can you name a right that uh, a man has that a woman doesn't? And he was like, you know, I wasn't going afterwards. I was like, yeah, that's right, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> you lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It it it, it takes. A lot of patience on your part to not want to win, right? Necessarily, and it takes uh, some patience on their part to be willing to admit um, that maybe they don't have the all the answers to this random person, that right? Just met. And that's a great place to start taking off your blindfold and start exploring, right? Yeah, yeah. That that's uh, that's what Sandra Bullock needed to do. Do it gradually, gradually, you know? <laughs> not all at once. But uh, yeah, interesting movie, nonetheless. Good movie, yeah. You know, it definitely opens up a can of worms in terms of interpretations. I mean, the memes are hilarious coming out of that for sure. <laughs> and I can't wait for the next one with uh, Elizabeth Warren coming out there announcing a presidency recently. So, 
blindfolds will be off. <laughs> the uh, she will be telling everybody. I'm exactly pretty sure she's got one out of one thousand twenty fourth uh, chance of winning. So, you know, didn't Trump also have those that level of odds? That's very true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think he has any Native American blood. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So that's a good uh, review. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, if you guys are listening, watching, thanks for listening in. Stay liberated.